So, hey, let's open our Bibles this morning, please, to Revelation chapter 5, as we continue our verse-by-verse study through this wonderful book of blessing. The only Bible in the, or book of the Bible that promises a blessing upon those who read it, who hear it, who obey it. Revelation chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 10 this morning. So let's go ahead, we'll read that and then we'll pray. Revelation 5, starting in verse 6. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we once again come to hear the teaching of your word. Lord, would you anoint each one of us here, those watching or listening, with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I don't know where everyone's at, uh, but you do. And I pray you take us deeper wherever you are. Lord, conform us, Father, more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just to kind of zoom back in on where we are, the Apostle John... Um, is on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, It's approximately A.D. 95. Uh, The Roman Emperor uh, Domitian uh, has reportedly tried to kill uh, John in many different ways, including uh, boiling him in oil. Uh, And he just came out as if it was a warm bath. And then, thanks for that, that was really nice. Uh, And so they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos, a Greek isle in the Aegean Sea. Uh, Today, it's actually populated by some 3,000 residents. And in 2009, uh, it was actually named um, Europe's most idyllic place to live by a magazine. But not so 1,900 years ago. Uh, Over 1,900 years ago, it was an extremely desolate island uh, where prisoners were basically sent to die. No supplies were given. Uh, It was described then as a wasteland. Uh, And it's interesting, in the midst of John having been sent there to die, which he didn't die, by the way, um, he has this revelation. Uh, In in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, If you just look back there, or you don't have to even turn, it just says there in verse 11, Jesus is speaking, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. So Jesus has commanded John to write a book, send it to the seven churches in Asia, and guess what? This is what we're studying today. Are you thankful that God told John to write this? I think it's so awesome to see just the beautiful connection. Now John has been taken up into the spirit, into heaven, we're told there in chapter 4. Uh, And he's giving us basically a glimpse into what heaven really is like. Again, as we said before, a lot of us have all these ideas of what heaven will be like. Well, as we're reading through, we have no need to guess. This is what heaven will be like. Now, some people, you know, probably won't like this. Uh, You know, there's no, uh, you know, the best golf course that's ever been or the greatest longest wave or the biggest shopping mall or whatever some people think heaven is. No, no. You see, heaven is all about God. And and he's invited us to be there with him, to bring him glory, to fellowship with him. But it's all about God. And that's the beautiful thing is we get these glimpses into heaven. And as we continue uh, here in in chapter 5, excuse me, uh, and in verse 6, I'm continuing personally to be in awe of what John is seeing and what he is writing down. 
Uh, so, I don't know, sometimes I just feel as we're in the midst of this. I, it reminded me when I was studying the other day, uh, just like what God said to Moses when he came upon the burning bush. Remember, and, and God is in the burning bush and Moses comes up and, and basically the Lord said to him, do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. And I truly feel that as we're coming here and we're giving visions that John is seeing there of God the Almighty sitting on the throne and then today we see Jesus and these creatures and, and the, the, 20, the 24 elders, all these things happening. It's just, it, it, this is holy ground. And it's beautiful ground. But it's interesting because God went on to say, he said, moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. You know, it's interesting. We've talked about this before. I've read that Revelation is the least studied book in the Bible, uh, in the church today. So many pastors afraid to teach from it. So many Christians afraid to read. Because you got weird stuff. Admittedly so. You know, you got these four creatures. You get all these weird kind of heads. You got coming up here, you know, seven eyes and all these different things. But when you take a step back and don't get caught up in that stuff, because again, it's so many rabbit trails we can go down and just step back and what's happening? What is God showing John? And, and it blesses us. To me, it brings a holy fear, just as Moses there with the bush, because we should be humbled that we've been given this great honor to see behind the veil. You know, I, re I remember, anybody remember watching, was it Wizard of Oz for the first time? I, I still remember when all of a sudden they're going to this, you know, wow, this is so awesome. And then they pulled the curtain back, and I was so disappointed. You know, there's that guy. Don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. We're seeing behind the curtain and it's more awesome than we could even imagine. More glorious. It's just beautiful. And I, I just, you know, and again, this, we've all been given this great honor for those of us who've been born again of the Spirit of God. This is all through the honor of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to be reminded of here today. Now remember, just to kind of come back into context, let's go back to verse 1 and kind of read through here in chapter 5. It says, and this is John again writing, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So we're kind of here in... Um, John has just been told, stop weeping, and he's weeping a lot. Uh, look at verse 6, it continues, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain. So first we note that here we come to the lamb. Uh, it, it, there's a lamb here, and notice it, first and foremost, it was in the midst of the throne of God. This lamb is God, as it's there in the midst of the throne of God. He was there with God the Father, there at the throne declaring his majesty, his glory, and his power. And it's a beautiful picture. Uh, we're told here that the lamb also is in the midst of the four living creatures, uh, and in the midst of the elders. You see, he is everywhere. He is omnipresent. He is all-powerful, but he is also omnipresent. And he is there in the midst of the living creatures, there in the midst um, of the elders. And he stood this lamb as though uh, he had been slain. Any ideas who this lamb might be? Anybody? <laughs> Notice it says, a lamb as though it had been slain. I've been asked as a pastor, hey pastor, will, will Jesus still have the scars when he gets into heaven? This kind of tells us that he does. 
that he'll be a, a lamb as though he had been slain. Remember last week, we were talking about that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And here he is described as the lamb. Now it's interesting, the lion of the tribe of Judah is looking forward. And you go back to chapter 1, you get it. Because remember, this is future tense. Here, he's, we're looking back, the lamb who had been slain. And we're going to talk about how he redeemed us. So looking backwards, he's the lamb of God. And he's still the lamb of God. But he's also the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so it's interesting. Here's, you know, this lamb, which is the very lamb of God. Uh, the word lamb in the New Testament is only used five times. Besides here in the book of Revelation. Now, in the book of Revelation, it's used over 27 times. And in the book of Revelation, every single time it's referring to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And this is a beautiful picture. And even in four out of the other five times in the, in the New Testament, it's referring also to Jesus. And even the one other time, I still believe it's pointing forward to Jesus as it's talking about the Passover lamb. And the word lamb here in the Greek is a baby lamb. It's not just, a, you know, this big old hairy furry. No, it's a little baby lamb. And, and it's a beautiful thing. But it's also, we, we see again, as I said, reference to, to the Passover lamb. If you'll turn with me to Mark chapter 14, please. Mark chapter 14. Because we see all this tied together again so beautifully. Mark 14, verse 12. Mark 14, 12. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go to prepare that you may eat the Passover? So here they are. It's the day uh, basically of Passover that is going to start uh, and the feast of unleavened bread. By the way, if you're here Wednesday night, we just talked about this and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. But it's interesting, so they're there and, and the, his disciples came. Jesus, where do you want to celebrate this? You know, when they killed the Passover lamb. And so basically Passover, like for us, if it was, let's say Passover was tomorrow, we would, it would start tomorrow morning, right? Or maybe technically it would start tonight at 12.01, if you will, right? And so, but for the Jewish people, their days start at sundown. So their Passover would have started when the sun set that day. And guess what happened that night? It's what we call the Last Supper. And guess what happened on the same day that they lifted up the Passover lambs in the country of Israel? They're in, in, in Jerusalem. They're at the temple. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was the Passover Lamb of God who would be lifted up that same day. The Lamb of God, as John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Is that a coincidence? No, no. It's God showing you, hey, look, even back here when my people were in Israel, I had it all together. I know what's happening. And even that, when they had to kill a lamb and, and put the blood on the doorposts, and that was pointing forward to, to, to my son that would come to be the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to be the propitiation, the payment for our sins. Jesus died for our sins. I like how a fellow named Anson Howard, he wrote a song about this. He said this, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace all day long. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Anybody have an amen to that? Amen. amen. You see, guys and gals, he is and was the divine lamb of God. John the Baptist said so in, in first, or John chapter 1, verses 29 and 30. Uh, Peter echoes it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. He says this, Knowing that you were not redeemed by corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a, of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, the Passover lamb had to be without blemish. 
had to be without spot. And that was pointing forward to the sinless life that Jesus Christ would come and lead. The spotless Lamb of God. Now look at verse 6 back in our text as it continues. So it says, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the, all the earth. So, you know, seven horns basically within the scripture is, is a sign of power. Uh, so powerful, seven eyes, uh, that he sees everything, that he's omnipresent. But notice these are the seven spirits. So again, we don't even have to try to guess. What are these seven horns and seven eyes? What is this? Well, it says right here, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. What are the seven spirits? There's only one Holy Spirit, of course. We've covered this a couple of times now. Isaiah 11, 2 basically says, as he's describing the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord shall, is the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Seven. So this is a description of the Holy Spirit of God. And remember, the number seven in the scripture is a number of completion. And so we need to understand this, a number of perfection. Uh, it's used some uh, 54 times, the number seven, in the book of Revelation alone. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's used 341 times. And so it's an interesting number. You know, I don't get too far into the num num numerology. I think it's a fascinating thing. But again, I like to keep the main thing the main thing. And so it's an interesting thing. Let's look at it a little bit, but let's not get off track. Look at verse 7. Then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Remember last week, John was weeping. There's nobody worthy to take the scroll. There's nobody worthy to even look at the scroll. And then here comes the Lamb of God. He who had look, looked as you know, though he'd been slain, he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Jesus Christ alone is worthy to take this scroll from the right hand of God. And again, uh, it's interesting that uh, God is still sitting there. He, he is, uh, you know, still God the Father Almighty. But even now as he's taking this scroll from God the Father, this still shows that Jesus Christ is, is on the chief throne of all creation. He, he, he is God. You see, for Jesus alone is God. Uh, in part of the, the second person of what we call the triunity or the trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God eternally existent is three distinct persons. How does that be? How does that happen? I don't know. I don't. I've had people, uh, you know, so funny on the radio. Oh, Pastor, I can tell you how this, is, how this works, you know. And, and they give me an illustration. It's like water, you know. Sometimes it's wet, sometimes it's steam, and sometimes it's boiling, or sometimes it's frozen. No, no. That, none of these illustrations, and Lord bless you for trying, sincerely. But I don't care if I know. That's the difference. I, I'm humble enough to say, you know what? You're God. I'm not. I don't care. This is what you say in your word. I believe it. And we have to come to that point because there will be things. Well, how did God, you know, create nothing, you know, everything out of nothing? Well, because he's God. Yeah, but how can the earth only be 6,000 years old? There are stars that we know are, you know, billions of light years away. Well, if he's God, it's not too impossible for him to put light in between that star and this planet, is it? Because he would know. He created it, Remember? Look, he, this is who he is. It's, it, it, it is what it is. Now, again, here he is. He's taking the scroll out of the right hand of him who sent it. One commentator said this about it. He said, in the act of receiving the scroll, it is made evident that judgment and power over the earth are committed to Christ, the Son of God. And, and as we will see, is he's the only one who can open the thrones. And as we see, or the, the seals, excuse me. And, and so Jesus says he's receiving this. And we know these seven seals are seven seals of judgment. The judgment of God. Each seal is a judgment of God. And when he opens the first one as we're coming into chapter 6, thus begins the tribulation. Thus begins the judgments of God. But only Jesus Christ is able to do this. Only Jesus is qualified. 
we all think that we're qualified to judge the world somehow. I don't, I don't know how we get that, you know, angst in, in us. And we all can do it, amen? We can all, well, look at what's happening. If, if I was God, I'd do this. No, 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 I praise God that he's God. So this shows the power of who Jesus Christ is, that he is God. And we're going to come to more proof of that in just a few moments. But what's interesting is we see this whole picture happening now. Turn with me, if you will, to Daniel chapter 7, because we also see it written of in the book of Daniel. Very interesting. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel 7, 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. And again, as you, we read this and we keep studying what we're studying, you see it all ties together that all peoples, all nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So we see this all throughout the scripture, so beautiful. But now as we come into verse 8, come back, you know, it's with me to Revelation 5. As we come into verse 8, we see now that Jesus is now going to be worshipped. Now, again, I love to take, especially Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, sometimes other cult members, and I just love to take them to the book of Revelation. Because I say, now, what are they doing right now? They're getting, oh, they're, they're worshiping God. Yeah, but who does it actually say is God? And I bring them back. Look at it, it's the Lamb. Who's the Lamb represent? And I, they, every time they're just like, hey, it's time for us to go. Let's get out of here. It's like, no, no, no. Jesus is God because there's only one person that is to be worshiped. Who is that? God. So notice the picture that we're coming into here in verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So now, first of all, we note that Jesus has taken the scroll. He hasn't opened it up yet. Um, and yet again, we see now these four strange looking creatures. You know, the, these living creatures. And then we see also uh, the 24 elders uh, who have now left their thrones that are around the throne of God. And now they've come to worship Jesus the Christ, the Lamb of God. They fall down before the Lamb. I love this. They fall down to worship Him. They fall down in adoration. You know what, guys and gals? Just again, remember that, you know, these are mighty beings in heaven, no matter who they are, what they are. And yet they're humbling themselves before God. How much more important for us, right? To be those, even when we're worshiping the Lord, even as we're living throughout our days, just to be humble servants of our God. Worshiping because he deserves worship, not because he did what we wanted him to do. Oh God, thank you for doing this. I'm gonna praise you now. No, Lord, you said no on this. I'm still gonna praise you because you're God and I'm not. You're worthy and I'm not. Now, notice here too, look, check out what they each have. They have now have harps. Now, what's interesting, anybody see the picture, right, when you get to heaven and then you get these big old harps, right? And, you know, and, and that's why some people, dude, I want to go to heaven. It's, so, it's like, oh, you get these harps, so boring and this and that. Well, first of all, it's not about you, it's about God. Amen. But next, no, just a quick thing, a few things on these harps. I think it's interesting. First of all, harps are mentioned three times in the book of Revelation. Uh, and in chapter 15, verse 2, we're actually told that these harps are harps of God. So they're, they're, they're of God. Now, what's interesting, too, is each time these instruments are mentioned in the book of Revelation, they are always in giving, used in giving glory to God. Imagine today. If all the musicians of the world, and even throughout history, always just sought to give glory to God. Imagine if all the Beatles wrote were praise and worship songs about God or songs of his faithfulness. Imagine if Lady Gaga or some of those today, they were just singing songs about Jesus, biblical songs. 
You know, but they don't, do they? It's kind of a sad thing. As a matter of fact, so many Christian musicians like to start out as Christian musicians, and then when they get famous, oh, I'm going to cross over into secular music. Look, I, as a musician, I've been a musician for a long time. I started out in a Christian punk rock new wave band back in the 80s, and uh, I had, you know, visions of grandeur for a while. But I'll be honest with you, there is no greater honor than to help lead God's people in worship. None. None in all of the universe, period. Uh, when we get to heaven there, we're not going to see all these musicians. No, we're, we're going to see humble people who just want to love God, praise their God, worship Him. So each time these instruments are mentioned in Revelation, they're always uh, used in worship of God. And even here uh, in verse 8, as they fall down before the Lamb, they get their harps out, they're getting ready to play a worship song to Jesus. Again, I love that. Now, what's interesting, what are the harps that he's seeing, though? Because I find, again, as a musician, I, I, I find this interesting. You might not care about this portion of the study, but I think it's interesting. We know they're stringed instruments, right? But, but that's all we know. It's actually interesting because the Greek word used here is actually more associated with what they call a lyre, uh, L-Y-R-E. And basically what that means is it's almost like a combination between a guitar uh, and a ukulele. Like it's kind of this weird, you know, fat body. And, you, you know, you've probably seen them maybe in some old movies or paintings. It's that kind of vibe. But what's even uh, really interesting to me is the Greek word here is kitara. And it's where we get our English word guitar from. So they could just as well be sitting up there playing a Taylor or a Martin guitar, <laughs> praising their God. Seriously, it could be, you know, we, we think of it like this, but it could be anything. But here's the thing, it's going to sound so much better than, you know, any, uh, you know, harp, or it's going to sound so much better than any guitar because they're of God. And I, for one, I can't wait. Lord, where's my new guitar, dude? Where's my new? Woohoo! But again, just to be able to praise my God. And, and I just love this. So, but notice here, not only do they have these new harps or lyres, but we're also told, notice, that they have golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So they have, again, we don't know how they're holding everything, but they have, a, you know, this lyre thing, and they have a bowl that is full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Do you ever think of your prayers as incense unto the Lord? Anybody come from like a Catholic church or a church like maybe Orthodox where they used to use incense? I was an altar boy, so I got to go around and ching, chicka ching, chicka ching. You know what I'm talking about if you've been there. If you don't, oh well. But it would, the smell would permeate and it would go up from the incense and it would permeate. And that's what this is representing, our prayers to the Lord. That's what they are to the Lord. So again, I don't know about you, but I want to have there to be a lot of incense. Some people don't hardly pray at all. It'll be like, is that from Joe? I don't know. It's hard to tell because he hardly prays. I, I don't know. I want it to be, oh, that's Bill praising me oh that's bill lifting up his prayers to me oh and that's what what it reminds us of in, in psalm 141 2 it says let my prayer be set before you as incense lifting up my hands as the evening sacrifice this beautiful picture and they're lifting them up you know i don't believe in in, in coincidences uh, last, this, just this last Wednesday night, we just happened to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 30. And as we're in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, we come into a very familiar picture as what we're seeing here in Revelation. Uh, we basically, uh, the, the, the people of Judah and Israel had not celebrated the Passover, right, for many years. And, and King Hezekiah said, dude, we're going to have a celebration. We're, gonna, we're getting everything back right with the Lord. We're going to, let's send out invites to even to Israel in the north who are not even friendly with anymore. But man, let's do this and let's all come together and celebrate Passover together. And so they came together. Uh, there was great celebration. There was great um, uh, repentance. And, and the celebration went, which is usually a week. They said, dude, at the end of a week, this is too awesome. Let's keep praising the Lord. Let's go another week. And so they went for another week just praising the Lord as they were celebrating and remembering the Passover again in Egypt 
when the angel of death had come and they'd sacrificed the lamb and it passed over their houses and even today as we who are in Christ that angel of death now passes over us because we are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ but it's interesting in 2nd Chronicles 30 verse 27 it says this then the priests and the Levites arose blessed the people and their voice was heard and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place to heaven their prayers rose up and so even back then they were told that that this you know this whole thing and then it gives you the the thought of being in the outer courts there at the temple and that's where the people would lift up their prayers and they would have incense burning and we need to look at our prayer lives as lifting up incense unto the lord you're bringing everything to him, bringing all of our prayer requests, bringing all of our, you know, petitions, but also our praises and our thanksgiving. So here they are, the elders. They have their harps, their golden bowls full of the prayers of the saints, his offering of praise. Look at verse 9. And they sang a new song. Sang. And I just one real quick, a couple quick things here. Now, there's, I don't know if you've ever heard of people who are hymns only. There are churches out there, and some people hymns only man that's all we'll say that you know they're going to be bummed when they get to heaven because all of a sudden look here's a new song they're singing hey wait a minute we don't sing these old you know new songs we only sing the old stuff it always cracks me up when people say that just we just want to sing the old songs or the old hymns uh and by the way if you know me at all you know i love the old songs and i love the old hymns but here's the thing they, they don't want to ever do anything new. But it's a good thing they weren't around when these hymns were written because at one time, guess what? Shh, they were new. <laughs> don't tell them that. <laughs> Look, there is always a time to sing the old praise songs, the old hymns, but there's also always a time to sing a new song unto the Lord. To sing a new song, a joyous song songs of lament whatever it might be look here's the thing that's important isn't is the song biblical is the song biblical does it bring glory to god does it teach some theological stuff that's true right you know there's a lot of songs out there today by the way that are new that are junk you know jesus is my boyfriend and he loves me so much he loves me 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 it's, it's seriously it's like and worship has become about how we feel instead of just dying to ourselves and lifting up praise to our God Amen. it's not about us here we see a new song and I love this you know it's cool too though by the way for the old people like the or for the people who like the old songs guess what in chapter 15 here in Revelation they go back and they sing the song of Moses they're singing new old I love it I'm gonna be whoo this is gonna be awesome and this is beautiful. Now look at verse 9 as it continues. This is what they sing. What are they singing with their guitars? You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. He is worthy he is worthy he's worthy you are worthy you know there's so many things to note here but for time's sake I'm just gonna kind of breeze through a bunch look notice that this song that they wrote it's all about God it's all about God it's singing to God you are worthy you were slain you have redeemed us to God by your blood you have saved us out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation you have made us kings you have made us priests and even those yeah you made us kings and priests but he goes on to say unto our God this is all about God it may pop with some you know egos in here today get them popped let them go let them float away with the wind it's all about God. Notice it first says, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals. You see, guys and gals, Jesus alone is praised as being worthy to do the things that only God can do. Only God can do them. You know, it's interesting. I don't know about you, but it kind of sounds like a weird thing to praise God about, isn't it? Like, you are worthy to open the scroll and it seals. It's like, 
If I sat down to write a praise song and I've written some praise songs, I just, I wouldn't do it about a scroll and them opening the seals. It'd be like, you're so awesome, Lord. You're the coolest guy, you know. But, but not this. They take what we might think is mundane. And we need to understand this isn't mundane. That's what I'm trying to say. This is God Almighty who is about to put an end to mankind as we know it. And he does not take it lightly. It is not taken lightly. It is not done in a light manner. And only God himself can do it. You alone are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals. And, and remember, the, the, the four living creatures, you know, and the elders around the throne of God, they're singing this praise song to Jesus and de declaring that he is worthy to do this. And I really think that it's mainly the 24 elders as we're going to see what they're singing in just a moment. God is always worthy of our praise, guys and gals. Even for the most simplest of things. Did you wake up this morning? Everybody here wake up this morning? Yeah. Did you praise God when you got up? Oh, whoops. Oh, I forgot that again. Seriously, just even... <laughs> I'm still here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thanks for your new mercies today. Sometimes you're like, oh, bummer. Yeah, well, yeah. I know. <laughs> But God is wor worth our praise for what we might consider the most mundane things. A flower comes up in a bunch of weeds. Lord, that, that's from you, isn't it? The sun comes up. God did that. I mean, we think about so every, anything you see that's beautiful. God did that. The heavens declare his glory. Notice it goes on to say we're given some divine truths as to why he's worthy. It says, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Now this is why I think it's mainly the 24 elders and that they represent the church here because they are singing that they have been redeemed, they have, you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Who has been redeemed? The church of Jesus Christ. We have been, there's no angels that have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. No creatures that we're aware of, but just us. Not, and not just us, us. And again, notice here too, by the way, it doesn't say that you're redeemed by your good works. I'm redeemed by all, I got all this stuff. How come you're going to heaven? Well, I kind of cleaned up my act, you know what, 63. And now I'm, you know, I've done this good thing, that good thing, this good thing. I've been a good father. I've done it. It's like, you know what God does with that list? It's like, roll it up, throw it in the trash. Because it's not about, that's not how we're redeemed. Redeem here in the Greek is a form of the Greek word agaz, excuse me, agorizo. And it literally means to buy from a marketplace. You see guys and gals as sinners and the Bible declares that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. And so also the Bible says that the wages, the payment that we get. You know you have a severance package for being a sinner? Did you, do you understand that? You get a payment for being a sinner? It's called death. You know, the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. So everybody who has sinned and everybody who has ever lived has sinned except for Jesus Christ. And so that payment is death. And that's not just physical death, but eternal uh, uh, life in hell. And then one day hell will be cast into the lake of fire. And all those in hell will also have been gone through the great white throne judgment. Um, but also uh, those that are thrown into the lake of fire, that for all eternity there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what it is. So we have a debt because of our sin that we can only pay with our lives. That's the reality. Yet Jesus came and he led a perfect light. Remember life, the, the spotless lamb of God. He was sinless, but hold on. He didn't owe a death, but he was still killed. Remember on the cross, he still died. So basically he died a death he did not owe. So God the Father has made it to where we can enter into Jesus and his death to make payment for our debt. As we repent of our sins, believing in Jesus to have Christ to have paid our debt upon the cross with his death, receiving him as the Lord and Savior of our lives, and then we are then born again of the Spirit of God. We then become disciples of Jesus Christ. How? Through his shed blood that he paid that debt that we could not pay. 
You see, Jesus is the great redeemer. For time's sake, let me just give you a couple of scriptures. 1 Corinthians 6:20. For you were once, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Galatians 3:13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it is written curses everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of abraham might come upon the gentiles in christ jesus we have been redeemed if you have been born again of the spirit of god you have been redeemed by the blood of jesus christ if you have not been redeemed here's the beautiful thing you still have time to enter into that redemption you still have time to say lord i receive your payment upon the cross my pal pastor used to tell a great illustration. Let me tell it to you. It's called basically the, the, the boy who lost his boat. There's a little boy named Tommy, and he, he, he built this model boat. It was a sailing boat made out of wood, and it took him many, many weeks to build. And when, when, he, when it was completed, he carefully came and he set it in the water uh, in this lake that had a, an attached river to it. And as, you know, he set it out, he had a little string attached to, to keep hold of it. But as it began to, the wind began to blow. Tommy's boat sailed great, by the way. And as the wind came, it kind of, all of a sudden, it just caught it in the wind and he slipped on the, the string and he tried to go into the water and all of a sudden, it just kind of started going down towards where the river, the outlet was. And there goes the boat just floating away and Tommy was crushed. His boat gone. Tommy ran along the sandy shore trying to get it, but he couldn't do it and he went home. Now, a few days later, when he was on his way home from school, he went by a second-hand store, happened to look in the window, and guess what? He saw a boat there. And he, he, he goes, you know, that, that looks like my boat. And so he, he went and took a closer look, and he said, sure enough, that's my boat. So he runs inside the store, tells the manager, sir, that's my boat in the window. I made it. And the manager replied, sorry, son, but someone else brought it in this morning and I paid money for that. If you want it, you'll have to pay a dollar for it. Tommy ran home and counted all his money, all his pennies and, and change, and he came up with exactly one dollar. He ran back to the store, rushed to the counter, and he said, here's the money for my boat. And he was heard saying as he left the store, as he hugged his boat, he said, now you're twice mine. First I made you, and now I bought you. You see, that's Jesus Christ. He's made us, and he's also purchased us for those who will enter into that purchase. It's a free gift, by the way. You don't have to do anything, just believe. You enter in by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. Now, real quick as we're closing, look at the, the rest here of verse 9. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, oh, the great mercy and grace of God. Notice it's not just of the Jewish people, but it's of every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. Amen. Look. If you're prejudiced here, first of all, let me call you to repentance. Prejudice in any way. Because you're not going to be happy in heaven anyway. I think the pre prejudiced people are going to be more happy in hell. Here's why. Because there's going to be people in heaven of every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. So I say to the, the, you know, the prejudiced people out there, get real. Get right with Jesus Christ. There's no place for that in Christianity, Period. You call yourself a Christian and you're prejudiced? Let me just say it this way. You're a liar. Period. Look at verse 10. And have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Now we covered this, the priests, uh, kings and priests, back in chapter 1. You could look at the study on that. But, but I'm, it's just such a beautiful thing to think. Uh, you know, I used to be taught that only the people up at the top, they could be priests, they could be... No, no, we're all part of the royal priesthood now. And one day we're going to be kings and queens. How, how, think about it that way. Now, I, I think that this is referring uh, to the glorious honor that we're going to have as Christians uh, who have been raptured and then the, the tribulation takes place and then Jesus returns at the end to set up his, his millennial reign, thousand year reign upon the earth. 
and that we're going to be helping him rule upon the earth. Now, the key is, by the way, it's like, woo, I got to be a king. I got to be. No, no, we got to help him. It's unto him. It's for his glory. Oh, Lord, man, this is so awesome that you even will use us. Think about that. He, by his divine grace and mercy, will use us to reign with him. His blessings know no bounds. His grace so deep. His love beyond measure and his holiness whiter than snow. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, sometimes you're, the, the things you tell us and show us, they're overwhelming to us, Lord. But I pray that each of us, Lord, would take time to truly meditate upon you and what you've done, what you're doing, and what you will do in our lives, Lord, what you've promised. And your promises, Lord, are certain. I pray for each one here, those who are watching, Lord, or listening. Would you bless them wherever they're at with you, Lord? In Jesus' name, amen.